this, this lesson will deal with positive, we're, we're transitioning here into positive attributes. Um, remember attributes, plural attributes are not many different things in God, but rather they are many different things that we attribute to God. God is simple. He's not made up out of parts with lots of different things that comprise him and compose him. So the plurality of the attributes is not a plurality in God himself, but it's a plurality in how we perceive and know the simple, pure, and perfect God. And when we attribute things to God, previously we've talked about uh, negative. We've largely, up to this point, been dealing with negative attributes, which are negations. We've been saying God is not this, or God is not that. So we were talking about God being immutable. He's, he has no mutation. God is eternal. There is no succession in God. He is impassable. There's, there are no passions in God. Uh, he is immortal. No death or no corruption. Nothing. His being is not susceptible to dissolution and so on. So largely, we've been dealing with negative attributes because we know God the most uh, through by saying what he is not more than by saying what he is. Um, we know more about what God is not than what God is, and by saying what he is not, we more clearly declare the perfections of what he is. And the, the negative attributes, which we've been covering, they come from what we call the, the way of negation, where we consider what is uh, deficient or imperfect or of, of a lesser perfection in, in created things, and we say whatever, whatever those imperfections of being are, they cannot be in God. Of course, we would deny all moral imperfections in God, uh, but more particularly, any, any imperfection of being. So to, to be composite is a deficiency, so we say God is simple. To be mortal is a weakness, so we say God is immortal. To be subject to change and to passion is a weakness, so we say God is immutable and impassable, and so on and so forth. So the negative attributes often are primary, or they, they are often the first things that we say about God, and our confession really fronts or, or puts up front the negative attributes in chapter 2 and paragraph 1. But now it transitions, as, as theology typically does. This, the norm, this is the normal, classic shape of the doctrine of God as we present it or as it has been presented. There's then a transition to the positive attributes. And as a negative attribute is a negation fundamentally, a positive attribution is something that we, we posit. And to posit something is to put or to place. We're attributing this positively to God, saying this is in God. We're not saying this is not in God. The negative attributes say mutation and mortality and passion are not in God. The positive attributes are going to say this thing is in God. And I'm going to, to share a quotation with you uh, from a reformer named Zanchius. That's his, his last name. And maybe a little bit hard to see from there, uh, but he's going to, to talk about the, the positive attributes he says, when considering that which is good in man, such things were first in God, they're first in God, and that in a, perfect, in a more perfect manner than in the creatures. So we look at what is good in man, and we say what's good in us is originally in God in a more perfect way than it is in us. So also the names themselves, the names of these good things in us, inasmuch as these perfections are signified by those names, are more properly attributed to God than to the creatures. So the good things in us, they really belong to God first and more than, th than they do to us. Yea, they do agree and are affirmed of him before any creature. So these things are in God before they're in any of us. These are positive attributes. Therefore, we shall make them more properly to belong to God. We will speak of them in relation to God in a more fitting and appropriate way if we add some such words as doth increase the signification of these names. So we, we use qualifying words to signal that they apply to God in a special way and so distinguish betwixt God and the creatures. Okay, but what are the such, some such words that we use to increase the, the meaning? 
as if, as if that we call God most just, most wise, most mighty. See the word most. For by this, the word most, shall we put a difference between or betwixt the imperfect justice of man and the perfect and essential justice of God. So if you have your confession of faith, or you can just look in the hymnal in the back, going to be on page 671, page 671, chapter 2 of God and the Holy Trinity. And notice that this is exactly the way that our confession goes about uh, expressing these things. So, the Lord our God is but one only living and true God, whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, a most pure spirit. So aseity and simplicity are principally uh, proposed there. And then it goes into negative attributes, invisible, without body, without parts, without passions, immortal, uh, incomprehensible again, the light which no man can approach to, immutable, immense, eternal, that's a negation, incomprehensible, and then almighty, every way infinite. We've already talked about infinity and omnipotence. And then what happens? And then you get a transition to all of these most affirmations. Most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory. Most loving, and then that most continues to apply. Most gracious, most merciful, most long-suffering, etc., abundant in goodness. I just want to point out to you the, the switch in the language from the negative attributes without or in and such prefixes, and then it moves on to positive affirmations or positive attributes with the prefix most to signal, to signify to our minds these things are in us, yes, but they are first in God, and therefore they are originally, essentially, infinitely, immutably in God. And this morning, we're looking, about, we're looking at the first few of these positive attributes. And I said that the negative attributes come from the way of negation. If you recall, the positive attributes come from the way of eminence, which we spoke about in previous lessons earlier on. The way of eminence, where the good things in creatures are more eminently, originally, perfectly, infinitely in God. So foundation we laid earlier is now being played out as we express our theology, our, our um, theology proper, our doctrine of God. And the first of these positive attributes which we will consider is that God is most holy. God is most holy. Holy. When you think about teaching on God's holiness, how many of you think of R.C. Sproul? His videos, The Holiness of God, or his book, The Holiness of God, has been very influential and helpful for many people. And I, I remember those videos. I was just a young boy, but his, his teaching presence is quite impressive in the sense of it Im impresses upon you a memory of him furiously writing with, the, with his chalk. Uh, I remember on, on social media, someone once uh, sent a message to the Ligonier social media account, and they said, can we just get a video of Dr. Sproul writing furiously on the chalkboard with no, no speech? Like, he's not talking, he's just writing. And they said, we've got you. And they posted a video like a minute or two long, just uh, all a whole bunch of clips that had been pasted together of Sproul writing furiously <laughs> on the chalkboard. It was great. Anyway, uh, holiness. The holiness of God. We can be holy. Men, men can be holy. Angels, angels can be holy, right? God is holy, but God is most holy. We use the word most to say holiness begins with God. It starts with God. He is the sum and the source. But what is holiness? What is holiness? And the, the definition may surprise you, but it's a good an important definition. Holiness is God in conformity to himself. 
the holiness of God is God in conformity to himself. You may be accustomed to thinking of holiness and the holiness of God as something like the absolute absence of sin in God, which would be true, but we don't want to define something in God in relation to something outside of God or that is not God. And so the holiness of God is not God with relation to some other eternal thing. That would make sin this eternal polar opposite to God. It would create a dualism in existence. And so the best definition of holiness is not God without sin, as though sin's always been there, but God's always been separate from it. There's no duality of etern eternal being. God and some equal opposite or at least other negative force. No, there's just God. And God's holiness is God in conformity to himself. And so if we define God's holiness as the absolute purity of God's being and absence of sin, it's unintentionally, uh, it, it's a deficient definition that unintentionally establishes a certain kind of eternal dualism and a flip side to God. So it's not moral purity, because that's the, that's the second problem with thinking of holiness as the absolute absence of sin in God. It, it creates a dualism. But it also indicates that if, if we think about God's holiness as God's perfect moral purity, we're putting God under some standard of morality. That there is some eternal law and standard that God conforms to perfectly. But there's no, there's nothing and no one greater or other than God that he's conforming to. There's no eternal law that governs God that he's conforming to. His holiness is God in conformity to himself. So is it true that God is, is being is completely absent and pure from all sin? Yes, that's true. Is it true that God has a perfect moral purity? Yes, that's true, but not because of anything outside of him defined by relation to sin or anything outside of him defined by relation to an eternal law that he conforms to. God's holiness is God in conformity to himself. The scriptures say in 1 Samuel 2, verse 2, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. His holiness is self-defined. There is none holy like the Lord, there is none besides you. Isaiah 43, verse 3, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Now, once you have creatures and created things that are not God, then sin is defined as a lack of conformity to God. But that's on a creaturely level of things that are not God. Sin is any lack of conformity unto or transgression of the law of God. So we, we tend to think of sin as the opposite to holiness because we do not conform to... A sin would be non-conformity... but it's nonconformity to God. <laughs> it's not nonconformity to some eternal law that God also conforms to. Sin is any lack of conformity unto God and what he has set for his people. So it's true that uh, God's holiness in the scriptures is often expressed in contrast to sin. For example, uh, in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, it says, you are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. So God's holiness is sometimes spoken of in contrast to sin, but it's not in contrast to some eternal thing on the level with God. It's in contrast to the wicked creatures of the world that he has made and have fallen away from the goodness in which he created them. So yes, sin, is, sin and holiness are an, an, uh, antitheses, opposites, but between God in conformity to himself and creatures who are not in conformity to God's holiness. And because holiness is conformity to God, therefore, we can be holy. And God commands us to be holy as he is holy. He makes himself the pattern. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. And Peter quotes this in 1 Peter 1. Peter 1. 
But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So, God is immutable. We're, we are not immutable. God is holy. We are holy. But we are holy in relation to God when we conform ourselves to God and to the law that he has established. And he calls us to live within that holiness. When we live in a holy way, we are conforming to God. God being holy is just God in conformity to himself. Nothing other or greater than God. So the holiness of God is best defined as God in conformity to himself. Could anyone therefore be more holy than God? <laughs> He's the source and the sum. He's the most holy. So he is eminently, the way of eminence sees something positive and good in us. It attributes it to God first and foremost. He is most holy. The second positive attribute is that God is most wise. And by second positive attribute, I just mean following the, our confession of faith as it lays these things out. It talks, speaks of God as most wise. We're not going to deal with this now because in uh, paragraph two, it speaks about God's knowledge a little bit more fully. And so I'm going to save God's wisdom and knowledge uh, until we get to paragraph two uh, next semester, Lord willing. So we're going to, to skip over wisdom and knowledge and go to the fact that God is most free, God's liberty. Do you ever stare at words and suddenly they just look so strange to you because you hadn't really looked at them before? That's what happens with most. I just look at M O. The longer you look at that word, it just gets weirder and weirder and weirder. And then the letters all move around and unscramble them. No, just kidding. That doesn't happen to you. God is most free. What do we mean? Why does the confession, why, why do we confess that God is most free? And what we mean by this, we're defining it, that, is that he is not compelled by any external force. God is not compelled by any external force or influence. The explanation of what this means seems more difficult than it actually is. So we say that God wills himself, he wills his own being necessarily and freely. Okay? If we ask the question, why is God? Why does God exist? Why is God? It's not because there is some will of someone else or something else that causes him to be. There's nothing outside of God that causes God to be God. Remember his aseity, whose subsistence is in and of himself. So he is, he exists, he is because he wills himself necessarily, not by the will of another, so he's, his being is not compelled by any external force that causes him to be. He wills himself necessarily because it is his nature to be. But he also wills himself freely because there's not some kind of nature of deity of which he is a subset that forces him to, to be the deity that he is. You know, animals act as animals by a necessity of nature, because God made them to be that way. There is a, an animal nature that they are acting in accordance with. We're not saying that there is a divine nature that God acts in accordance with. So when we say that he wills himself necessarily, 
we're not talking about some divine nature that God has been placed in as a category and a, a thing that precedes him in form and therefore he has to be that way. But he also wills himself necessarily because it is of his nature to be. <laughs> he, he is. So he's, he, he wills himself not by the will of another or some external or higher force of, of nature and necessity. And he wills himself freely because he's not compelled, but it's, it, is, it is his nature to do so. He, he does it because that's who he is. So to be or to exist because it is of your nature to be <laughs> is to be the most free possible because there is no compulsion from anything above or outside of you that causes you to be. You are the most free being if you are ase, if you are of yourself. We, we started out in, in paragraph one, whose subsistence is in and of himself, and that therefore establishes him as the most free being. God has given us freedom. He's given us a liberty of action. I am choosing to stand here and speak the words that I'm speaking. I am choosing to write the words on this board that I choose to write. God has given man a freedom, but it's not an absolute freedom. It's a created freedom. God has an uncreated freedom. He's the most free. There's not, I am acting not by compulsion. I'm not a marionette. I have a freedom, but God, he wills himself necessarily and freely, nothing compelling him or moving him from, from without, from outside of him, Therefore, he is the most free. As free as I am, my freedom is dependent on God's uh, creation of me and his decree of all things. God is the most free. Uh, next is, so most holy, most wise, most free. We're skipping most wise to come back to God's wisdom and knowledge in paragraph two. The next is most absolute. God is most absolute. And that's a word that we tend to use in a somewhat different way now. We usually use it as a, um, an intensifier. Those tacos were absolutely awesome. <laughs> Are you absolutely sure? We think of absolute as an intensifier. God is most absolute. Why do we confess that God is most absolute? Well, the definition of absolute in, in its technical use, such as in theology, is that God is without relation. To be absolute is to be without relation. So this really goes hand in hand with most free and with aseity. So God is most absolute with relation to being. Uh, his being depends on nothing else. He, he is because he is. I am that I am. So with regard to being, he's the most absolute. His being depends on nothing and no one. Without relation, if you, if you delete all created existence, God remains. I am that I am. His being is not dependent or relative to anything outside of himself. He says, I am God and there is no other. There's no panoply of gods. There's no pantheon. What about knowledge? We'll come back to that, of course, but how does God know what he knows? Not by virtue of something outside of himself. God does not see things outside of himself and therefore know them. God knows all things because he knows himself. His knowledge is most absolute without relation to other things. In paragraph two, we say his knowledge is independent of the creature, not dependent on the creature. Most absolute with regard to action. Why does God do what he does in history? Is it because something has, has moved him and caused him to do and to act? No, he, he acts because it is his will to act. He has chosen. He is most free, and he is most absolute. 
we can be more or less relative to certain things. We are more absolute or less absolute in relation to our, our relations to things. <laughs> And the more you commit yourself, the less absolute you are. <laughs> and sometimes you feel very overwhelmed because you're very related to many things, and they pull on you. But God is most absolute. He's most free. I am that I am. He's most absolute, and there is no other. Going through these things, and we're, we're still just working our way slowly through paragraph one, gives us a better sense of as much as we can discern what it means to be God. And just, he, he becomes more glor uh, glorious, but also more incomprehensible in a way. Uh, you think, oh man, to be God is so great, so majestic, so glorious. I'm beginning to understand it more, but the more I understand it, the more I see it exceeds my understanding. The closer I get to the light, the brighter I find the light to be. I think we will finish this today. <clears throat> Most absolute, without relation, and I, this is something that I've been mentioning to uh, our men who are in theological studies, is you have to pay attention in theology to the language of, of absolute versus relative, because it comes up all the time, and if you're, not paying, if you're not paying attention, not so much not paying attention, but if you're not aware that that is a, an antithesis, that that is a, a contrast, absolute versus relative, you miss uh, the precision of uh, scholastic distinctions and, and precise theology. So you'll hear absolute this versus relative that. It, it was mentioned by Pastor Chuck Rennie, both in his sermons as well as in his um, conference lectures this, this past um, Sunday. Wait, that was two weeks ago. I, I don't remember. I can't. I'm too relative. My knowledge is way too dependent. <laughs> and my action. Am I? All of it. I, I'm, I'm tempted to say, do you understand? But we should all kind of say, sort of. <laughs> the last thing, the last positive attribute is will. We attribute will to God. The, the quotation in the confession says this. It's, it's using the scriptural language. It says, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory. He works all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory. So we attribute a will to God. This is a positive attribute because... You have a will. I have a will. God made us with wills. That's The will is a faculty of the soul, a power of the soul to make decisions. Uh, if you were in the conference, you heard a lot about the soul and that we have intellect. Is there two L's or one L in intellect? I should know, but I don't. Uh, I put two L's just to be safe. Intellect and will. The soul has intellect by which we know things. We perceive and we know things. And then the will makes decisions based on what we know. We've talked about, or we mentioned, God's wisdom. That would be, in a sense, intellect, but we're waiting to talk about that. Here we come to will. And we do not attribute a will to God as a faculty or a part. A will is, my will is a part of me that God has given to my soul which I use to make decisions to choose to act with the freedom that he has given me, we are attributing will to God not as though God, there's a part of God called his will, uh, but rather we attribute a will to God because it means he's not some principle of nature that just does what it does like gravity pulls, but rather God chooses to act, and the scriptures speak of his counsel. The scriptures speak of his election, the scriptures speak of God choosing to act in one way as opposed to a different way and speaks of his will. So we're, the scriptures attribute will and counsel and choice to God, and so we speak of him that way, but not as though it means God has a, a, 
a part or a faculty of will. So God works all things, as we confess, according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory. And here, as we attribute a will to God, we're coming back to God's, God being most free and most absolute with regard to action. Why does God do what he does? Because in his, in his freedom and absoluteness, he chooses what he will choose because he chooses it. He does what he pleases. That's what the scriptures say in Psalm 135, verse 6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. To speak of something pleasing God, doing what pleases him, is to attribute will, choice, decision, counsel to God. By attributing will to God, we do not, not only are we not attributing a faculty to him, we are also not attributing deliberation to God. When you use your intellect and then you, you evaluate good or bad, and then you make a choice, there's a process that you undergo of successive actions of thinking and choosing. And then you say, I'll have the carnitas, please. Or I'll have the chocolate tower truffle cake, please. Or you get it. For us, the choice is at the end of a chain of, of actions along a period of successive moments. When we speak about something pleasing God or choosing and such, we ought not to think that there is deliberation in God. God is eternal, without succession. And so God's choice is the way that we speak about the effects of God's decree as they play out in time, but it was all determined before it happened. Because the scriptures say in Isaiah that uh, God speaks and declares things, the end from the beginning, things not yet come to pass. Uh, and so when we see oh, Jacob is loved and Esau is hated, it's not because God just decided that and through a process of deliberation or came to that choice after some period of time and evaluation, it was God's decree to choose Jacob and to pass over Esau. So we attribute will to God because the scriptures speak of choice, counsel, deliberation, action, pleasing, and so on, but it's not a faculty and it's not deliberation. Why, is, why do we say that God's will is, uh, or, excuse me, but to speak more positively, but we do attribute a will to him to express that he chooses to act or he has acted in one way when he could have acted in other ways. God has decreed this world when he could have decreed another world or he has decreed this world in this way when he could have decreed this world in another way. So God is not a principle of law or, or something like gravity. He is a being. He chooses to act in, in eternity, as difficult as, as that is for us to comprehend. And because God has will, therefore all things exist. All things exist or just are. Why? Not necessarily, but freely because God willed to make them. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All things are because God willed them to be. We do not exist by necessity. We exist because God freely chose to cause us to be. If we existed by necessity, uh, it would... We'll, we'll actually come back to that in just a moment. So why do we say that God's will is immutable, his immutable will? If God could have created otherwise, why say that his will is immutable? Well, let's keep in mind as much as possible the, the chain of uh, affirmations that we've been making uh, and you see them right there in the confession in paragraph one, the, the doctrine of God we've been developing. And we've said that God is omnipotent. Remember God's 
active potency, that he is able to actualize all things possible. God has infinite active potency, omnipotency, so he is able to cause to be all things that can be. That was our lesson on omnipotence two weeks ago. But we said that God is not omnivalent. God can cause all things to be that can be, but does God will all things to be that can be? No, he doesn't. He can cause all things to be, but he does not choose to cause all things to be. He chooses to make the things that are. And having chosen to make the world that he has made, it then and therefore is by consequent necessity, it becomes necessary because God has made it to be. And what God has willed to be, once he has willed it to be, that cannot be changed. So what he has willed is immutable. It's not that God cannot will, could not have willed other things. He's omnipotent, but he's not omnivalent. He does not will all possible things, but what he has willed to be, because he has perfect power to cause it to be, it most certainly will be. So God can will many changes, but his will has not changed. In fact, there's a confusing phrase that gets used sometimes in, in older literature where they say this was mutably decreed by God. Let me see. Mutably decreed. Right. <laughs> but what they mean is God willed the various changes that you see with one immutable will. So God wills to permit um, the Ninevites to fall into great wickedness. He wills to send Jonah to warn them of their destruction. He wills to make that warning effective to bring them to repentance, and he wills to therefore relent of the disaster that he threatened. And all of those things are, are, seem like drastic shifts and changes from our perspective. Nineveh will be destroyed unless you repent. We repent. Nineveh will not be destroyed. Did God change his mind in that sequence? No, God did not change his mind. His will is immutable, but he mutably decreed it. He decreed the various changes. So it's not the greatest phrase, but just letting you know, you might see that in literature, something mutably decreed. It's not the decree that's mutable, it's the decree that has decreed various changes. It's not the will of God that's mutable, it's the will of God that wills various things to be differently. So because God is omnipotent, he could will all things possible to be. He could will to be all things that are possible to be, but he doesn't. He's not omnivalent. But what if God were omnivalent? Let me share one more quotation with you from Edward Polhill. He said this, if God creates of necessity, if he willed to create because something was compelling, him, if there was a necessity in God willing, then his will must produce things to the full extent of his power and so must produce all the possible worlds and creatures lying in the bosom of omnipotence, which would be infinite actual beings, and produce them all as early as eternity itself, to speak humanly, and all those infinite actual beings so produced should be necessary beings, because God necessarily wills them, as well being just as necessary as God himself, in all which many great contradictions are involved. If God creates by necessity, uh, and there's really no will at that point, then the fullness of his omnipotence would actualize, omnivalently would, and omnip omnipotently would actualize all things possible, and as he put it, as early as eternity, and then all things possible to be would be just as eternal as God because they are necessary to him because he created necessarily. As he said, it's like dividing by zero. The whole thing just explodes. So God does not create by necessity. He creates by will. He has chosen to decree the world that is. All things exist because God has willed them to be in his omnipotence, but not omnivalence. You see the, the volent, deo volent, deo volente, God willing, 
omnivalent, potency and voluntad in Spanish, the will, volition, yes. Uh, just a little etymology. We speak of being benevolent, oops, that's an E, and malevolent. To, to will good to someone and to will evil to them. And then there's And there's beneficent to do good to someone and maleficent to do evil to someone. So willing and action uh, is where we're getting these, these words from. I guess we, if we could just make up words and say you could be benepotent <laughs> and malepotent. <laughs> I am able to do good. I will to do good. I do good. <laughs> I am able to will evil, I will evil, I do evil. For God, to be able to do something is to be able to will it and able to do it. He, with perfect potency uh, and free will, God's will being the most free, most absolute, God is able to do all, all things. But he has not done all things. He has made the world that is. But what if he created other worlds and didn't tell us? Well, then he didn't tell us. So stop asking. Great. Well, we have finished um, these four positive attributes. It was five, including wisdom, but we, we skipped over wisdom to save it for next semester. Uh, these are positive attributes. We attribute them to God because we also uh, have holiness, and we also have freedom, and we are also absolute uh, in certain senses, and we also have will, but these things are first and foremost originally and eminently in God uh, before they are in us, and they help us to better understand uh, what God is so that we can worship him and serve him faithfully. And so next week, I haven't decided exactly what, but my intent is to do a, a historical presentation, a PowerPoint of some kind, to share with you some of the research that I have done, but not been able to do very much for a while recently. But anyway, so I look forward to sharing that with you. Thank you for your attention for today. That's all.